Carol and Stephen's life together was perfect. I've got to get going. Right this second. Hey, baby. Hey, sweetie. Mwah. I love you. There's one small problem. Hi, I'm Ralph. I'm his brother. We're twins. Are your parents, um... Yeah. It can tear them apart. I think you're going to let me know that everyone in your family's a midget. They're not midgets, Carol. They're dwarfs. Whatever. Or bring them together. Hey, welcome. I'm Steven. Oh, there you are. This is Steven's father, Bruno, and his mom, Kathleen. And over behind the bar is Steven's brother, Ralph. Hi. You could have prepared us for this, don't you think? If you embarrass me, I'll never speak to you again, so just get it together. Hey there, buy the drink. I think maybe I'm pregnant. When the going gets rough, it's only the size of your heart that counts. Would it really be that big of a deal if our kid was a dwarf? You knocked up this great girl and you didn't tell her that her baby's probably going to be little. I'm not like you. We are so cute and cuddly. Don't discriminate against us. You said these parties got a little wild. I never expected this. There's sure a lot of midgets around here. You better back off, Goldie Hawn. My man can do what he wants to do. I'm ready for an adult relationship. What is this man doing in your bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> A walk down the aisle. Ah, uh, Stevens, uh, he's a very lucky guy. I just hope he's smart enough not to screw it up. Is just a beginning. There'll be rough patches, there's no doubt about it. Canal Plus and Langley Productions proudly present command performances from Kate Beckinsale, Matthew McConaughey, Patricia Arquette, and in the role of a lifetime, Gary Oldman. Tiptoes. Welcome to They Call Us a Movie, testing the strength of friendships one terrible movie at a time. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and the podcast services by searching They Call Us a Movie. We're part of the Main Naming Network, and to find more from us, check out the website at themainnaming.com or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the Main Naming. We're also now a proud member of Geek Vibes Nation. You can find them at gbnation.com. Welcome back to They Call Us a Movie. This is Anthony Delvecchio. With me, as always, is Dan Aquino and Mark Meyer. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello, friends. Hello. Um, this, uh, this movie that we're doing here i can't imagine um how they talked everyone into this um because i couldn't imagine going up to gary oldman and going hey you're gonna do this for an hour and a half you know on film are you ready you know that's it, that, commitment to the craftsmanship exactly man. it was just i don't know i've been thinking about that all day not not much of a you know thinking this will be a good bit or anything but that's been rattling in my brain since i saw this movie like i would love to be behind those conversations for gary oldman is a professional all right he's a consummate professional and he likes challenges i think sorry i thought he was gonna polish off an oscar right yeah oscar bait for sure uh (laughs) yeah this movie is another weird one but before we get into that uh you guys want to discuss what we watched this week sure yeah since uh you know we're still stuck at home uh, i actually took full advantage this week i watched two new uh i don't know if they're brand new movies to netflix but i know one of them was uh i watched the disaster artist from uh, james franco and man that movie is so out there (laughs) and it it was a tough watch but only because it's meant to be cringeworthy obviously with tommy Wiseau being just out of out of his rocker but i enjoyed that movie a lot it was a lot of fun and then i watched uncut gems and Mm -hmm. i don't get it I, it wasn't a bad movie, but I just, it, it was so, there's so much anxiety in it yep. that I, I couldn't really enjoy it. And Adam Sandler sounds like his one buddy who does the, uh, who's the quarterback from Waterboy. Do you know sure. who I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So his accent is just kind of all over the place. But yeah, I, I, I know everyone praised it so much. I could see why, but it, it just wasn't for me, I think. Okay. What about you, Mark? I haven't watched anything this week. The uh, you know, outside of my normal, you know, just things on the internet. I think the longest thing I watched this week was the entire show of last week tonight. That might that half hour might be the longest thing I've watched this week. Just kind of trying to do things in short bursts. Not as much to talk about as last week, but 
it's nice to hear Dan checking out a movie such as The Disaster Artist, knowing you like The Room, right, Dan? Or... I've never seen The Room. Okay, Dan. Oh, my goodness. Why I haven't know. we done The Room yet? Well, <laughs> I was going to say, we should, once, you know, the apocalypse ends, we should try to get to a midnight screening, because I'll be closer to you guys now. Mm-hmm. So we, we can make that happen. So, yeah, I'm, I am full bore into going to see that movie man it's it just it's out of control <laughs> okay i will i take back my thought on you the disaster artist because i thought you would held off after seeing the room for some reason yeah this week i, I did a, a bunch of revisits can't really remember anything that i've seen this week that i haven't seen before i watched through each of the back to the future trilogy oh um i you know i Usually watch the first one at least once a year, maybe not if not more. Watch the second one and the third one I watched for the first time in a very long time, and it's not as bad as I remember it being. Uh, there's definitely not as big of a drop off between the second and third one as people want you to believe. I think there are some like the middle part of the second one is not as good as I remember it, especially when like they go to the house and you have Michael J. Fox playing his own daughter. It's just kind of really goofy. What else did I watch? I watched Clueless which is a movie that I've seen a thousand times. I revisited Black Klansman, and then I revisited a movie called Stay Tuned, which I haven't seen since I was a kid, and it stars John Ritter and Pam Dauber as parents that get sucked into their satellite dish. And it's got a whole, <laughs> bunch, of, whole bunch of parodies. It's like, oh, what's his name? Uh, I think it's the principal from Ferris Bueller, if I'm not mistaken. I was Jeffrey Jones. Yeah, I was Jeffrey say, Jones. What is name? I'm looking it up. Jeffrey Jones plays basically the devil slash uh, satellite dish uh, installer, and he sucks them into the TV to play some games from hell, and then they get sucked into a bunch of different channels that uh, are all like sort of like things, but are, have a weird twist on them. So like they get sucked into a movie called Driving Over Miss Daisy, <laughs> among other different parodies. And there's a, a little moment where John Ritter gets sucked into Three's Company, um, which is a funny little nod. But Pam Dauber does not get sucked into Mork and Mindy, so that's it. And that's about it. I watched a documentary about, uh, what is it called? It's called Have a Good Trip, Adventures in Psychedelics, which is on Netflix. It's just a bunch of comedians and actors and actresses talking about their experiences with uh, LSD and shrooms. Kind of interesting. Nothing. It was kind of light and, uh, you know, interesting. Um, Sting's on there and Sarah Silverman, and Paul Shear and uh, I think Rob Hubel and Nick Kroll, all those, all those kind of people talking about that stuff. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. It's fascinating. Couple, I find it fascinating. A couple buddies of mine and I were talking about uh, Guillermo del Toro yeah. and how he picks weird uh, movies to direct. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I'm not I like Guillermo del Toro, but I, I've seen a few of his movies. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of his work, but I, I talked about how I enjoyed Pacific Rim because it's just so ridiculous. And my buddy says, you know, I saw that movie while I was on acid. And it was one of the best experiences of my life because everything is like the monsters are already colorful and there's a lot of color in the movie. So everything's just really coming at me. And, you know, my mind couldn't handle giant robots fighting giant monsters. And I was just freaking out. But I loved every second of it. I was like, you know what? I think that move, that, that would make Pacific Rim a hundred times more enjoyable. Just <laughs> being on a being just tripping balls. <laughs> Now, would this have made you more pissed off about the helicopters, Dan? I don't even think I would know what helicopters were if I were tripping. <laughs> I would just see, you know, I'd probably see like Rock'em Sock'em robots coming at me or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we watched this week. And now it's time to get into the movie that we watched this week. And technically, this was Dan's pick this week. So, Dan, do you want to introduce um, your movie? Sure, yeah. This. So, full disclosure... This was not my first pick. Mm-hmm. My fir- I had my first pick ready a couple weeks ago, and I was very excited because it, it, it was very corny and very over-the-top silly, and it was an actor who we had not yet covered, and I had picked Jackie Chan's The Tuxedo. And right before we were going to watch it, Prime took it down, and you know I'm, I, I'm left scrambling for a movie, and I, I had 
a couple movies where I, I wanted to go, but Anthony was saying, you know, none of them seemed on brand. And I agree, none of them were really our style. And he suggested Tiptoes. So I, I looked at the letterbox and, um, yeah, I was hooked immediately. Just knowing that Gary Oldman plays a little person, I, I needed to see it for my own two eyes. And I'm not <laughs> disappointed that I did that because this movie, who oh boy, it's it's wacky man but not wacky as in like comedy wacky it's just what were they thinking wacky (laughs) yeah so uh this movie is tiptoes from 2003 directed by matthew bright who directed freeway with Kiefer sutherland and reese witherspoon and it seems like this movie ended his career it (laughs) stars matthew broderick uh, not, not matthew broderick it stars matthew mcconaughey kate beckinsale Gary Oldman, Patricia Arquette, Peter Dinklage, Debbie Lee Carrington, David Allen Greer, and Michael J. Anderson. It has an IMDb score of 4.4 and a Rotten Tomato score of 29%. So, gentlemen, yeah, where what's where are you coming with tiptoes, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I, I was totally brand new to this movie. I didn't know it existed. I was content not knowing it existed. And you brought it up, and it, it has such a nice, like, it has a caliber of stars here, where, you yeah. know, you, you hear Matthew McConaughey, and everyone loves the guy. But you got to remember that this is pre, you know, uh, Dallas Buyers Club, obviously. This is early it, 2000s McConaughey you're getting. You're not getting the show, good stuff. Show some respect. It's the McConaissance. Mm-hmm. I can't pronounce it correctly. <laughs> so I'm just trying to save face. Um yeah, and then this this movie hit before everyone else hit, right? So you have pre Game of Thrones Peter Dinklage, uh, and but then you have Kate Beckinsale, who's like always on the cusp of being a good actress, mm-hmm. but then she chooses tiptoes and just sets herself back to square one. Yeah. So she's she's always just behind the eight ball, it seems like. Yeah, I mean we've got we've got three Oscar winners and we've got an Emmy Award winner in this and and, and Kate, Beck- Kate Beckinsale. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, they're all kind of like in interesting places in their careers at this point. So I kind of uh, bef- uh, before I do, Mark, uh, you go in oh, with your. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole time Dan was talking, I've been thinking of Matthew Broderick playing the Matthew McConaughey character and how much of a different movie this <laughs> with just Matthew Broderick being a complete dick in the entire movie. Um, so anyway, uh, I mean, how many people did uh, Matthew McConaughey kill? Zero. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't even. No, so coming from this, I came in um, pretty much blind um, uh, outside of the uh, um, fact that Gary Oldman and Matthew McConaughey was in it. Um, So when when Oldman first shows up, it took me five minutes to realize that that was him and not a little person actor. Um, So then I was like, okay, I hope this is a wild ride here of, um, you know, just uh, Gary Oldman doing Gary Oldman stuff, but it was just, this movie, I couldn't place, it felt like, you know, it was just a breeze, like, I never checked the time on it, but I can't really remember why things happened, but I am glad we did watch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I will say one thing about this movie, it moves pretty fast, I mean, because we've watched two movies back-to-back that are 90 minutes long, and the the length of them are very different. Um, I think Love on a Leash feels like it's two and a half hours, and this yes. movie feels 90 minutes. Um, it's not good in any way, but like <laughs> just nothing happened, really. Yeah. It's it's one of those weird like mid-90s sort of romance movies that are just kind of middle of the road, and they're really inoffensive, but then you add offense to it by just having this really misguided plot about Matthew McConaughey hating his little person family. Yeah. Um, I've never watched a movie where what you assume is the protagonist of the film is completely irredeemable throughout <laughs> it. And not even yeah. throughout it. He makes a turn and halfway through the movie that is, is scary and violent yeah. and upsetting. Yeah. It, it was very confusing because in the beginning of the film, McConaughey is he's a, a defender for little people. You know, everyone's like, oh, you know, they're dwarfs. And like, no, you don't say that. They're little people. Or no, right. the, uh, midgets. They call Kate them Beckinsale midgets. 
yeah. staunchly says midget like four times and right. he has to keep correcting her. And then he corrects her once and she's like, I don't care about that stuff. Like, right. Damn, Kate Beckinsale, you, <laughs> you kind of suck in the beginning of this movie too. Well, that's the thing. There's like a total role reversal between McConaughey and Beckinsale. But yeah, at, at first it's made to, you're made to believe McConaughey is the good guy here, you know, coming from a, a family of little people and trying to educate Beckinsale, who's, you know, his girlfriend slash fiance, whatever. But then all of a sudden, yeah, he just he gets scary at the uh, like towards the end. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting that whatsoever. That that twist, that was a twist worthy of M. Night Shyamalan, man. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. In the hospital scene, when he's holding the baby, it looks like he's about ready to throw that baby out the window. I was convinced he was going to kill the child. (laughs) Like, like he's, I can tell, don't give him the kid. He's got those wild eyes that we saw in Serenity. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. I'm about to murder this baby. It, you can kind of see, <laughs> you can kind of see the apprehension in Beckinsale's eyes too, because he's like, let let me hold him. She's like, uh, uh okay, uh, you know, just you know, try not to bash his head in if you if you don't mind. <laughs> and I was convinced he was going to try to you know whoops i dropped him but oh man that, that was a very tense minute i would say of, of, of cinema <laughs> yeah uh, before we get too far i just kind of wanted to discuss because we mentioned that this cast is pretty pretty strong cast i just kind of wanted to go through where they were at their times of their career so we've got gary oldman was just i mean obviously he was big in the 90s he had you know uh, the fifth element air force one lost in space you know professional um, and then he was just about to hit um, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, as well as Batman Begins, would have been two years after this. Yeah. Um, Kate Beckinsale was just coming off of um, Underworld, same year. Underworld came out in 2003, as well as Tiptoes. Pearl Harbor was 2001, as well as Serendipity. So those were her like breakout roles. And then we were just a short while... Uh, away from her starring in an, in a Martin Scorsese film, The Aviator, in 2004, as well as Van Helsing. And then she'd just go on to do Underworld and click all those movies down down the list. So she was right right in the heart of like her just becoming a, a, as big a star as I guess she'll ever, she would ever be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She was always, just like I was saying, she was always like right there. And then she decided to do click. And then yeah, I, it was like, yeah. Her, her decisions aren't great. To be honest with you, exactly. I'm looking at this. Yeah, and she's a fine actress. Yeah, and you know, she's a she's she has bad. a marketable face. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Like she's absolutely stunning, and she's great looking in this movie. It's it's amazing how she someone could squander such beauty. She's <laughs> and she's ageless. I think she's probably mid forties by now, right? Early to mid forties. Uh, 1973. Uh, she's you know she's not far from fifty. Yeah, there you go. But she still looks great. Yeah. So, but but like. Just, yeah, there's not there's not much great stuff. I mean, she's got what do we got here? We got vacancy after click. We got vacancy, which I think is a horror movie. Um, yeah, like suspense thriller. Yeah, with like I think Michael Shannon. Is that is that right? Uh, isn't that oh, James no. Marsden? This is no, that's Straw Kate Beckinsale, Luke Wilson, oh. Frank Whaley, Ethan Embry. That movie uh, was so bad. I watched that for 31 days of uh, horror. Right. And uh, yeah, that left a bad taste in my mouth. But then. Uh, Underworld sequels, Whiteout, I remember, because she's got, like, a scene where she's just in, like, white underwear, I think. Michael that Keaton's was, like, in that movie, right? I think that's White Noise. Oh, White Noise. Okay. She, this is where she's, like, in Antarctica. Uh, mm, never saw that. Yeah, I haven't seen it either. I just remember, the pro, like, all the production stills were just, like, she's in her underwear in this. A Total <laughs> Recall remake, and then, yeah. like, a bunch of Stoneheart <laughs> Asylum absolutely anything do we blame her or her agent uh, it's got to be a little bit of column a and column <laughs> yeah, B, right? right man yeah she has not had a great turn of the century um matthew mcconaughey where was he he's so 2003 he also had how to lose a guy in 10 days before that was frailty which is kind of similar to vacancy i think <laughs> yeah. um and then he went on his mid-2000s run of movies like sahara uh two for Fool's the money Gold. Failure to launch. We Wait, are Marshall. This, this is the rom-com era of Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, it, he's it's... got Tropic Thunder thrown in there too. Surfer, comma, dude. Ghost of <laughs> Girlfriends past, and then The Lincoln Lawyer is kind of where he starts to turn it around. 
in 2011. If I could... Bernie, Killer Joe. If I could describe Tiptoes in, like, one sentence, it's a 2003 movie that screams 1993. Sure. Yeah. From the way everyone dresses to the writing style to even just, like, the pacing, it seems like this is a... Just... A 1990s rom-com movie. Yeah. But it just, it never got past 1990. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, so apparently there is a, there is a Matthew Bright cut of this film that was shown at um, Harry Knowles' butt Numathon in Austin, Texas. And, and they recut it. I think it was supposed to be like, it was supposed to be like two and a half hours long, an hour and 50 <laughs> minutes, like 150 minutes, which, yeah, this movie was two and a half hours long that deserves to be cut and they cut it down to like 90 minutes and i think if i if the wikipedia is correct basically the at the sundance film festival 90 minute version screen uh the director bright criticized the film and lambasted the producers for editing the fil- editing his film leading them to drag him off stage oh jeez <laughs> made a, that, that might have been why this was his last movie subsequently bright would not direct another film and later said that the film's failure hurt his career yep that makes sense this movie doesn't need a director's cut it was just it's cut and simple you know just you have a love triangle that's kind of weird and comes out of nowhere yeah and that's it really you don't need it you don't need two and a half hours of that no it's just a really misguided movie and it should it there's a lot of reasons. It's the picking Gary Oldman to play a little person is is a weird choice. I think this movie would have been better if it just leaned into more, just more comedy. Like, you have McConaughey and Oldman. They're not brothers, or maybe they're friends, uh, family friends or whatever. And they're trying to win over Beckinsale. And McConaughey is the, obviously he's the good looking guy where, you know, of normal height. He's brash and he's cocky, but Gary Oldman's character is, you know, if you want to keep him as the little person for God knows whatever reason, you have to do that. And he's, but he's just the nicer guy. He's not crazy like McConaughey, but he'll take care of you. You know, he'll have you home by ten, and he'll he'll hug you goodnight, and he won't be a jerk. McConaughey, you know, he'll keep you out all night, and he'll do blow off you, and yeah, you might live a danger, <laughs> like you might live on the edge of danger there. But you're not going to be fulfilled with Matthew McConaughey. You'll, you'll be more fulfilled with Gary Oldman. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. I kind of went Oldman. off on a little tangent there. I apologize. I'm like, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> Where do we I, go from here? I, I, I don't know if that uh, <laughs> statement has ever been made. <laughs> you know, the, you, <laughs> to compare Matthew McConaughey and Gary Oldman. But uh, sure. This movie is forcing us to do it. It's funny that they're that they're supposed to be playing twins and they're like ten years apart. <laughs> yeah, and look nothing alike really. <laughs> uh, so you guys want to get into the plot? Sure. Yeah. Alrighty. Uh, before we do, Dan, what do you got for us? Okay, so you know the stick stick. Sorry. Uh, top ten with Tia, good friend of the podcast. She has her own podcast where her and her crew go down the top ten lists of the week. So, for instance, top ten villains or top 10 on-screen couple. So make sure to listen to that. That's at Geek Vibes Nation, uh, along with all the other awesome podcasts that they have. Go sh- check it out. Okay, and uh, we're going to take a moment to listen to some messages from friends of the podcast, so we will be right back. Hey, this is Ken M. Padawan J. Coach Duffy. From the Ocho Duro Parley Hour podcast. Every week, the ODPH is talking sports, movies, TV, comics, and more. It's always a parlay of topics on each episode. You can find the ODPH on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, and wherever you find great podcasts, such as the one you're listening to right now. Don't forget to check out OchoDuroParlayHour.com, where you can find the links to all of the ODPH social media accounts, links to the bands whose music you hear each week on the show, hashtag 607 podcast info, and parlay points are a companion block section of the show. Thanks for listening to the ODPH. Now get back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, travelers. Seems like you're looking for a story. Well, I got one for you. It involves adventure, friendship, and all hey, sorts hey, of... Hey, uh, Earl, why don't you tell him about that time I stole that big-ass melon? Yeah, yeah, I, I was going for more Or you epic. could tell him about the time I kicked her ass, Earl. I wouldn't ever tell him Do I need to get time. my ref gear on? Okay, everyone, shut up. Now come with me. 
as I tell you a story from afar. Hey everybody, my name's David. I'm the DM for From Afar Podcast. A From Afar Podcast is all about four friends separated by distance, brought together by adventure. Hope you all stop by and give us a listen. Thanks. And welcome back. Now it's time to get into the plot of Tiptoes. We open on Gary Oldman driving around on a three-wheeler and then immediately dissolve into something else. That something else is Kate Beckinsale's enormous painting of pink curls. And pa- Kate Beckinsale is kind of dressed, and we're going to probably talk about her wardrobe a lot throughout this episode. But she's dressed like someone from the 90s, like from, I don't yeah. know, uh, Reality Bites or something like that, basically. Uh, Matthew McConaughey shows up as Stephen and tells Beckinsale that he's got to go out of town for family stuff. And he's very coy about what exactly he's doing. I think uh, Kate Beckinsale's Carol is her name. Uh, she has a side comment about how he's going to meet his girlfriend or whatever. And then Kate Beckinsale tries to give him a blowjob and he refuses, which is ridiculous the most ridiculous thing in this movie uh, is yeah. it though i think the tramp stamp is pretty ridiculous <laughs> it was the mid-2000s though man it was that yeah. prime tramp stamp uh that's why low lo- rise jeans were a thing okay yeah. fair enough yeah. yeah this is like i it was one of those where um like they're definitely going um they're definitely going to stop them. um but and then it kept going i'm like why are they doing this so early in the movie they get you pretty know, far, too. Like, you see yeah. his, his tidy whities Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, shit, all right. Now we're getting, <laughs> now it's getting interesting. <laughs> this movie's not so bad. I don't know what <laughs> Anthony was talking about. And then he leaves. Yeah. She is about to get a blowjob, and then he's just like, nope, peace. That should have been our first sign. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. From an early 2000 Cape, I can say he refuses a blowjob. Ridiculous. <laughs> this is this is pre-Pete Davidson Cape, I can say. Oh, yeah. she's not tainted, is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, then we dissolve again into Gary Oldman and Peter Dinklage peeing on the side of the highway. Gary Oldman is playing a little, little person named Rolf, and Dinklage is playing a French anarchist named Maurice. A bus pulls over and kicks out Patricia Arquette, who sports some unfortunate cornrows, and Dinklage offers her a ride on his chopper. Then Matthew McConaughey arrives at a benefit con- a benefit dinner for little people. Little People's Defense League specifically, where his uncle is one of the lead, leads of it. And David Allen Greer is the MC with one of the worst wigs in history. He's not playing David Allen Greer. He's playing some uh, celebrity. They really never go into what he is or what he does or why he's famous. Yeah, he's well known enough that someone asked for his autograph later in right. the movie. Yeah. I, it was almost like a James Brown impersonation. That's yeah. what I kind of got from it. I don't really know what he was doing. Neither do I. I don't think David Allen Greer knew what he was doing there. Just, yeah. just go up there and be funny, dude. Oh, okay, whatever. Um, Matthew uh, Matt, uh, Stephen meets up with his parents. His dad specific, is played by the backwards talking little person from Twin Peaks, and they say that Stephen's brother hasn't shown up yet. And then Stephen go, then goes dancing with some of the girl, some of the little girls. And then at that moment outside, Stephen's brother Rolf shows up on his chopper with Maurice and Lucy, which is Pritchard Charquette. Maurice and Lucy go inside while Rolf and Steven talk outside, mostly about his chopper, and his parents would not be happy of him riding it around. And then Maurice and Lucy immediately get kicked out of the benefit for stealing food. Yeah, Uh, which they had that whole thing with Patricia Arquette. It's like, how can they say it's stealing food when food's from the earth or whatever? He's trying to play that weird spirit. This is an early theme that, you know, it continues throughout the movie where Peter Dinklage's character... Uh, wants to do something and is denied whatever it is he wants to do and he just goes off on a cursing spree Mm -hmm. uh it's it's pointless it adds nothing to the story yeah and it it just leads me to believe that you know like maybe they just they just wanted dinklage for his star power at this point yeah what was he i didn't get to him but he this was right around his breakout which would have been the station agent which was 2003, same year. Okay. So same year he had Station Agent, Tiptoes, and Elf. Uh, had Big some, year for him. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I I would think that they probably had that role as uh, as big as it is just so that they can not uh, feel like they made a movie about little people with the biggest, the only little person to have a substantial role was played by a person that wasn't a little person. <laughs> um, I will say... 
he has a decent French accent. Yeah, I mean, Peter Dinklage is a pretty good actor. Um, yeah, he would have been, he would have been great in Gary Oldman's role. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. There's no reason not to have him switch with uh, with Gary Oldman. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let Gary Oldman be the cranky little person, you know. Or don't have him in it at all. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Have him as the David Allen Greer role. <laughs> sure. With a bad toupee. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're making him be a dwarf. But what's the What's the difference of putting him in blackface? Oh, uh, well. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'd have to ask, I guess. <laughs> Is there a term for for a, a normal sized person playing a little person? I don't, I don't probably I don't not, so. right? This is I don't know. I mean, I, I was gonna say maybe this is the only time it's ever happened, but I mean, they used to do I'm it on sure. Martin all the time. But he was supposed to be a cool <laughs> kid, and then Tim Conway had all those dwarf videos. So all yeah. I know is both of these guys are being totally wasted in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> because it's and even it, like the trailer has like in a role of a lifetime. Gary Oldman. Uh, like, he doesn't really do much in this movie. They must have been talking about the director's cut. <laughs> Maybe. But it... do, do you think Oldman saw the script and was just like, well, wait a minute. This is daft. Why am I playing the little person when we have other little people here? And he showed up to this, uh, show up, showed up the set. Like, listen, you realize there's a ton like pointing. There's a ton of other little people here. That could literally be in my my character. Like, no, but you're Gary Old. Yeah, I appreciate that, but, but <laughs> I can't pull off everything, you know? You know what it probably was? Bright had probably seen The Lord of the Rings. It's like, well, you know, if they can get someone to play a hobbit, I can get Gary Oldman to play a little person. <laughs> can't be that difficult. Right. Uh, I just didn't figure out the camera angle thing. Right, yeah. Force perspective should have been, yeah. should have been how they accomplished this. That would have been great. Someone should have taught him that. Yes. <laughs> Not so many lookouts. He's just he's just twelve feet further away than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just shouting his lines. I love you too, Kate Beckinsale. So uh, Stephen and and Rolf they have their conversation, and then Stephen goes home to Beckinsale. So we get some McConaughey and some tidy whities um he yeah. crawls into bed and he still won't tell her where he was which makes her feel suspicious and then she tells him that she might be pregnant and he has a giant meltdown <laughs> it's so good I, I am also surprised that it took him 12 minutes to get mcconaughey shirtless right yeah well we had him pantsless in the first five yeah <laughs> so it was just he, working our way his his facial expressions when he has his little his little meltdown is is, is kind of crazy I sent the picture. I took a screenshot of it and sent it to you guys. It's, it's like they, it wrinkled his brain, man. Like I might be pregnant. What? But it's how? Kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like in Zootopia when the the slots realize that the joke is be, is a, there's a joke. So it's just like that <laughs> slow realization. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. It, yeah it's see, a total blonde moment. And, and I like that she keeps going. Are you okay? How are you doing with this? first of all ladies I, i'm not siding with mcconaughey here but don't bring it up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> True. you know just wait till breakfast mm -hmm. let the man have his oj or a cup of coffee and then drop the bomb on us all right yeah uh, it's and you so gotta much present better when it. we're eaten. yeah you have to present it she kind of just she brings it up to him like it's a problem it, you know what it was do, do you remember that scene in the other guys where Eva, was it Eva Longoria and Eva Mendez? Eva Mendez, I'm sorry. Where Eva Mendez and uh, Will Ferrell are discussing Will Ferrell's past, and she sings that song to him like "Pimps Don't Cry," and yeah. then she says that she's pregnant, like the the worst possible transition ever. <laughs> That's this. Yeah, yeah sure. Where, where were you? Uh, I was just out. I'm pregnant. What? There's no buffer. <laughs> yeah, it's like we could have just went to sleep. <laughs> Give me six hours. <laughs> could have told me as I woke up. Guess what? I'm pregnant. Right. Yeah, give me the day to stew on it at least. So like, now I'm not going to sleep. Yep. I'm I'm going to be. This is going to have long term consequences. <laughs> Kate Beckinsale. You'll yeah. see. He gets mad at her and he gets out of bed. Um. And then the next. Uh. Meanwhile, Rolf, and Maurice, and Lucy pull into a motel, trying to get a room for the night. The owner thinks Lisa is a prostitute, or Lucy is a prostitute. For some reason, I said call her Lisa. Um. 
What is it? her name's Lucy, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think last week's movie, the girl's name was Lisa. <laughs> yeah. um, the owner thinks Lucy is a prostitute, says he won't sell to prostitutes, but then they, you know, tell him that she's not. So he sells them a room at a discount because they're two little people. Get it? Um, yeah. Then in the room, Maurice and Lisa get drunk on morphine and cognac while Rolf goes off to take a shower. So they're making out, and then Maurice's back hurts, so Lisa tries to adjust it for him, and he gets mad and drinks more. Then Rolf comes out of the bathroom and tries to go to sleep as Mar- Lisa and Maurice get to the fucking. And then Maurice falls off to the bed and then stumbles into the bathroom to throw up. And then while Rolf tells Lisa, or Lucy, that he has <laughs> ulcers and herniated discs in his back. Yeah, it's, it's a little people problem. Yeah. Rolf goes to Rolf goes to call a doctor. Maurice yells at him not to, so Rolf leaves. So then Rolf goes to an old girlfriend's apartment, and she looks like a little person version of Gwen Stefani. And yeah. she's living with some guy that says this isn't her boyfriend, but they've fucked twice. And the guy she's living with comes home and says he's quit his job and he needs money for the bus. And he finds Rolf in her bedroom and he freaks out and slaps Rolf right across the face and starts punching him until Sally hits the guy with a boombox. And then Sally goes to call the police and Rolf leaves while Sally tells him to, hey, we got to wait to tell him what the cop he did to the cops. And he's like, nah, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, so he leaves. Then, yeah, just basically you know you tell them and then walks out and i'm like dude, during this whole scene i'm like they do nothing to establish why he would go to her nope. like at all like nothing that happens in this scene goes oh i get it probably you know? in the bright cut yeah they they explain it later on better um you know when mcconaughey is doing his whole speech in bed mm. about Rolf. but yeah. at this point it's like it yeah it was it, like i said maybe it's in the uh the, the matthew bright cut yeah. I mean, what kind of guy do you have to be to beat up a little person, by the way? All right, yeah. I mean, just full on pummeling Gary Oldman. Yeah. It's, it's not cool, man. Yeah, just, he he hit, he hits him pretty hard. <laughs> or do you think it's do you think that's better than just like being super disrespectful and just like picking him up and <laughs> and like throwing, throwing him? him outside? You know he what does I mean? drag him across the room. He does. Like, Rolf tries to escape by crawling out of the apartment, and he <laughs> picks him up. He picks him up by his legs and pulls him back in. And also, the guy has a cane. Gary Oldman yeah. has a cane. Come on, dude. I, I I guess they're trying to show that he's he's a low life. Yeah. But I don't know, man. Even low lifes have some standard, I guess, or some code. Right. They you just kind of take his cane away. He's like, oh, that's all I'm gonna do to you. Fuck <laughs> you, dude. Throw it out the window. Right. Go get it. <laughs> Fifth tan in style. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, he leaves and then we get in the morning, we get Carol watching a pregnancy test to reveal positive, And that's the scene. Meanwhile, Stephen goes to work as a firefighter boot camp instructor. And he's an this enormous asshole scene. the whole time. I love this scene. <laughs> he just makes fun of a guy named Chuck for his weight the entire time. <laughs> and gets called out by a female firefighter who in a better movie would be the subject of some sort of subplot, but it's not. Yeah. It, again, that could have been parts in the longer movie. Yeah. Because it, it, there's another scene where that could have definitely been a, a match, you know, point, you know, with later on when, when they go to the party. Yeah. Um, but no, she she just shows up and goes, I want to get that guy's autograph and then leaves. Yep. Yeah, there, there, she could be a point of uh, tension and drama between uh, Stephen and Carol, but they aren't. Uh, the entire time he's uh, he's yelling at Chuck, I just keep thinking, like, this is the Camp Krusty episode where, you know, we're not leaving here until this Christmas ham gives me a pull-up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so then after that, Rolf shows up at Carol's and introduces himself as Stephen's brother. And we realize that Carol might not have even realized he had a brother, let alone a little person brother. And Rolf mentions. I, I want to say first thing, she believes him immediately. Like, yeah, I mean, well, why wouldn't you? Yeah. No, no I know, but it. I, that was first. He's got a I cane, thought. Mark. What's he gonna do? <laughs> right. People with oh, canes don't lie. Yeah, he I just got the shit that. kicked out of him. Well, and I, I think it's that. also a well-known fact that little people are incapable of lying. <laughs> Right, sure. I think I think that's. I mean, or is that just a stereotype? That's folklore. <laughs> yeah. If it isn't, you just made it one. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's not a bad stereotype to have, though. No. 
Uh, so R- Rolf mentions that he got the shit kicked out of him. So Carol takes out a first aid kit, puts rubbing alcohol on some of his cuts. Then Carol finds out that Rolf and Steven are brothers and that Steven has never mentioned her to Rolf. Um, Rolf goes sit on sit down on the couch where they've sewn Gary Oldman into the couch with a couple of fake legs. <laughs> and then he falls asleep, so Carol puts a blanket on him. Yeah, so the, the only thing confusing is he uh, Matthew McConaughey's character is supposed to be away for a week, correct? Or something? I, I yeah, guess so. Yeah. For a couple of weeks. Yeah, and she still there's still the ability for her to drive to where he's at. Yeah. <laughs> he's, probably, he's fucking that other girl, right? Yeah. In, in, the, in the bright cut. He's fucking that other woman. Absolutely. Yeah, and she was she was intimidating that woman. She was like six six. Yeah, she she's on she's on the taller side, and you know she can obviously she can carry a full grown man because I yeah. think you have to be able to to be a firefighter. Yeah. So she, yeah, I, mean, she, I think she towered, she towered over McConaughey. That's all I know. Right, and I think that's what McConaughey liked, like, like smacking him up a little bit. Well, he well I guess he figures with his. He needs more chromosomes, so if she's tall and he's a if he's a dwarf as he calls himself, then maybe they'll cancel each other out. Right. Right. Yeah, they'll they'll get like a five he needs nine a tall woman to get an average kid. He needs an Amazonian, is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it's very sad how he his character takes such a huge turn in this movie. I know. Yeah, it's wild. It's such a such a weird choice. Yeah, it it comes out of left field, really. Yeah, because like, when he's talking to Rolf, like, he loves him, right? They're they're joking around and you know they're they're giving you know, shooting the shit together. And then all of a sudden, man, it's just like, yeah. I uh, was, like I wonder my if family it, sucks. Yeah, I wonder if McConaughey had ever heard any like questions of it. It's like, so I see here in this movie that's more or less very lighthearted and could be a real moment to showcase, you know, little people actors. I just become an enormous asshole at the end for no reason. <laughs> like completely irredeemable. Right. And they even try to like to make make him see seem like he's on the road to redemption. And then they just cut that they nip it right in the bud. Yeah. Like, nope, he's still a dick. Yep. She's like there's no reason why he has to be such a prick in this movie. No, this movie doesn't need all. an enormous prick in this movie. This is, like, it doesn't need it. Right. Yeah, because I don't think anyone goes from being a good person to just a total waste of human life that quickly. I mean, and, to be fair, we don't know that he's a good person. Uh, he kind of see that. I mean, at least they make it seem that way. Right. We don't see any character flaws in the, it, up front. Right. Well, they they definitely rear their ugly head like immediately when he thinks about the idea of him having a kid that's a little personal. And he does fat shame. Oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty harshly. <laughs> that should have been that should have been the first sign. Yeah. That... yeah at, at the same time, that guy was terrible at putting out fires, Chuck. <laughs> but he's trying to shovel the fire out with you know he's trying to shovel the dirt on the fire and he's like missing completely. So and it doesn't help when Matthew McConaughey his beautiful face is yelling at you. Right. Right. You're already feeling shamed by being in his presence, yeah. and then you can't even shovel dirt correctly. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, I mean it's he it's a firefighter, dude. It's the, it's it's not the military. So you <laughs> dial it back a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah, we're not in Full Metal Jacket here. Yeah, like that intensity is not really conducive to firefighters. <laughs> I think that's true, right? Because I mean, I I don't know very many firefighters, but I can't imagine. They have someone screaming at them at all times. No, I feel like you need to be calm, collected in the face of of an inferno to be able to do things properly and to clear out a building in the proper in the proper way. Yeah, you, know? <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have command screaming at you like, "Go get into that building, goddamn it, right now!" And you're like, "Oh my god!" And it feels like this isn't out of the ordinary because that love quote unquote love interest person just basically tells him to stop, and then he goes. I'll take five. Yeah. What we're you know. saying is hashtag defund the fire department. <laughs> is that what we're saying? This is what we're saying, right? Uh, yes. People like McConaughey shouldn't have those jobs. Uh, oh, listen, uh, if, if that's what the moral of the story is, then sure. Uh, that's in the break cut. Yep. Right. It, it's a whole thing in the break cut. Yeah. Um, so, the back of the motel, Maurice is recovering in bed after Lucy has put some gems on him. Because she's a free spirit, guys. And the maid knocks on the door because it's 3 p.m. and she wants to go home. I stand the maid. I totally get that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's 
she's not getting paid enough to deal with this. Yeah. So she goes against the manager who says checkout is at 12. So Maurice's plan is to shoot him. But instead, Lucy goes out and beats the manager with a phone. So then they have to pick up all their stuff and leave. They get kicked out of the, the motel. S- Carol shows up at Steven's work uh, with Kate Beckinsale's lucky striped hat. Oh, um, as mentioned, uh, Beckinsale agreed to take scale if she could wear this hat in this one scene. And the producers had a fit on set. But the director won the argument. It might have only been the the only argument he won throughout this film. Uh, but to be honest, this hat is a distraction. <laughs> it has no place in this movie. It looks yeah. silly. It's like a cat in a hat hat. <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's like, like, like it's a sleeping ga- a cat. It's it's a Tim Burton style like Nightmare Before Christmas hat. Right. It's like it, it's yeah. like a a night before the the poem A Night Before Christmas. This is <laughs> Ma and her kerchief and I and my cap. This is the yeah. I and my cap sort of hat. And what a weird demand to have, right? I'll be in your movie, but I wear my goddamn hat. You got yeah. yourself a deal. She just had like a free couple of months. She was like, yeah, sure, I'll do this movie. Like, I wear my hat. Right. <laughs> and you sure? I'm sure it went, can we see the hat first? No. <laughs> no questions asked. <laughs> no questions asked. Yeah, I, I would love to be hot enough where I could make outlandish demands and have them met. Yeah. That'd be great. But yeah, I'm 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 going to be in your movie, but I have to wear my slippers the entire time. Yeah. Uh, what? You're like, Dan, this is set in you know Alaska. Doesn't matter. I wear my slippers, or you don't get me. Got to get Fair some enough. of that. Got to get some of that hot woman privilege, right? Well, yeah, I guess that's what it really turned out. I mean, she she worked for scale, which helps obviously. But yeah. then yeah, you're you're getting an obviously beautiful woman, a good actress, but. If you um, allow an actress this to good enough for this movie. Sure. <laughs> she's not a you, Kate Beckinsale's not a bad actress, but she's No, but she's not know, great. No she's one ever like, said she should have gotten an Oscar for The Aviator, which many people got nominated for that movie, so. She's yeah. like a she's like the dime store version of Jennifer Connelly, I think. Sure. Neither I mean, I like Jennifer Connelly maybe more than I should, but to me they're they're very similar, but I just I put Jennifer Connelly just a little bit higher. Gotcha. And and if you're the director and you allow this to happen, I think you've already lost control of the set. And then <laughs> you don't deserve your cut at this point. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, if you if you're you've got a some sort of a comedy or a romance movie that's two and a half hours long, you don't deserve your cut. Uh, everything should be 100 minutes maximum. That I includes someone... you, Zack Snyder. <laughs> Learn how to tell a story. Yeah. Uh, I wish McConaughey would have pointed out the hat during their talk. Like it would, that would have been so funny, right? They're they're having this serious talk and just right in the middle of it, like, hey babe, what's with the hat? Just like totally derail the conversation. <laughs> like, you know, if if we're gonna do this, we have to be in this all the way. I, I agree with you, and and no matter what this child is, we're gonna love him. What's what that fucking hat? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she and she didn't even have it in the other scene. She decided I'm gonna go talk to Stephen. Got to wear my hat. <laughs> right in, in this. 90 degree California weather. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she shows up and she tells Stephen that Rolf showed up at the apartment and keeps saying the w- and she keeps saying the word midget throughout this entire conversation, even though Stephen keeps telling her that they're dwarves. She wants to know if their kid might be a little person. He says it's, it's possible. And Stephen says they could just adopt instead, then tells Carol to go home. Basically, Stephen is pro-abortion throughout this entire movie. That is that is the tension in this film is that his his he really wants her to say let's get rid of this kid. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's. <laughs> Without saying it very much. Yeah. I think cause... they do. I think they do bring it up. Or they. I don't know if they've ever actually say abortion, but they have the talk, and that's when he says they we could adopt. Yeah. Uh, it, and I think this is when we start to like you said it his character change rears its ugly head. Yeah. Um, we then get a scene where Maurice and Lucy make out at the park and it amounts to nothing. We cut back to Rolf arguing with Sally on the phone as he hangs up in anger. And this is at Carol's apartment. She tells Rolf that she's pregnant and he says that he has a friend that can refer her to a specialist doctor. And then Rolf then takes Carol to meet some family members, his uncle and his cousins. They give her some advice about raising a child that's a little person and they're all super helpful and supportive. And she gets... Very emotional about how nice they are being to her, and she cries. Um, late at night, Stephen calls Carol. He's avoiding her, and she's shot with a macro lens for some reason, where you only <laughs> see his, her, 
like yeah. por- portions of her face throughout the entire thing. Um, it, it just, it just, it felt like, uh, like it was shot in like a Skinamax, like yeah. proportion. It's very like, weird because it's just cutting between her shot like that and then Matthew McConaughey shot in a regular medium shot. <laughs> like she, sh- it, she shot like she's on one of those. Uh, sex phone hotline commercials. Yeah. Hot girls are That's waiting for you to call. <laughs> hey, stud. It's like, eye, lips, phone. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. shots of parts of her face. Um, and he's so upset about being invited to a party with little people that he tells her his phone is going to die and he throws his phone in anger. He then invites the girl firefighter to the party. It, so, it amounts to nothing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, was, I was like, oh, here we go. It's going to get juicy now, right? Because... Obviously, you bring another woman to make your girlfriend jealous. Yeah. This is Chekhov's gun. Yep. Right? And it never goes off. It never goes <laughs> off. It's the one time it, it doesn't go off. Yeah, Bright uh, said, fuck the rules. <laughs> Who the fuck's this Chekhov asshole? <laughs> I'll show him. Yeah. My producer uh, produced cops. <laughs> so Carol, Lucy, Maurice, and Rolf go to the party at David Allen Greer's house. David Allen Greer is a famous person named Jerry who has an affinity for little people. And he starts hitting on little Gwen Stefani. And Steven shows up with a couple of his firefighter hoes. Tall one immediately calls everyone midgets, which Carol corrects. And then she goes off to try and get uh, David Allen Greer's uh, autograph. Uh, then Maurice inside starts getting into a fight with Rolf's uncle. Maurice hates them because Rolf's uncle is the head of the, of the little people's defense league. And he feels like they don't take drastic enough measures. He basically thinks they should gain rights through a revolution. Um, then Rolf takes Maurice aside and tells him to get the fuck out because he's just an agitator and he's being mean to perfectly nice people. So Maurice and Lucy leave. Rolf and Steven have a conversation outside. Rolf thinks Steven is ashamed of him and his family. Then Carol comes out and starts arguing with Steven too. Then Rolf goes looking for Sally and finds her fucking David Allen Greer. And then Stephen goes to talk with Rolf and tells him to come home with him and Carol. And that's the end of that scene. What what a weird scene. I, Mark, you were saying how this party was going to get wild, right? Yeah, yeah, that's Rolf says it to uh, uh, Carol or she says it to him that like somebody mentioned that he has wild, this guy has wild parties. And she's like, I wasn't expecting it to be true. <laughs> and then all this shit happens in like a three minute period. Later. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you. There's no way. First of all, the, I've, the most disturbing part of this scene is uh, David Allen Greer making love to this woman with people just like half-heartedly watching. Yeah. Like, no one's really interested in it. They're just kind of there. Like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, and also the Maurice fight. Um, everybody's just watching it. Like, right. This is when McConaughey picks up. Um, Sally and puts her on the chair. <laughs> that was a weird move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very condescending. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I did notice that on my second viewing. I was like, well, that was odd. Like she's like a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> Putting her in timeout. <laughs> it's, uh, it's weird. Just a weird scene. It is, yeah. For not much to happen. Right. There's there's no development really. No. Right? If anything, I'd say the only development you get is that uh, Beck and Sale's characters coming around to, you know, having possibly having uh, a child who is a little person. She's working on the terminology. Yeah. As McConaughey says. And uh, and that's about it. Yeah. Which could have happened anywhere. In... Yeah, sure. <laughs> it could have happened uh, in the next scene, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because Stephen could have slipped and said midgets, and she says, actually, like, oh, look at you. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so Stephen and Carol have talk in bed, and Stephen talks about how raising a kid that's a little person is no picnic, and there are lots of complications, and then he goes on to talk about how normal of a life Rolf had growing up, even getting laid before he did. Then he might have, then Stephen might have had a circle jerk with a bunch of little people when he was a kid, um, but Carol makes the leap in conclusion, but he never denies it, so <laughs> there should still have been a flashback. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, and Steve asks if she's making a political statement by not wanting to abort her child. Carol suggests he sees a psychiatrist regarding his ambivalence towards his family. And then he acts like she shot his dog after that. <laughs> yeah, it gets depressing from here, folks. Yeah, it's a it's a weird like he just can't not say something stupid. I mean, which is, you know, <laughs> that's super realistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's if really. I had a nickel, if I had a nickel for every time I've looked back and was like, "Well, that was a really stupid thing to say, wasn't it?" 
it's it's and it's kind of on brand with uh early 2000s mcconaughey if you think about it sure he says a lot of he at one point he was known for saying stupid things and mm-hmm. doing stupid things yeah. so a it's long not time out ago of, he was playing his bongos naked yeah i mean people he's still connected to that people don't forget <laughs> And yeah, it's, this movie is just a lot of people saying the wrong thing at the wrong time and awkward, like awkward silence almost. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we have a dinner scene where we dinner introducing each sets of parents to each other. Um, in this scene, I am 100 percent on board with Kate Beckinsale's attire, which includes a dog collar and a, and a like light pink uh, purple dress. It was good. I liked it. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> That's parents. all I got to say about that. <laughs> uh, Carol's parents are surprised, but not particularly upset at the fact that Steve's parents are little people. Her mom is a little more reversed, but her dad fits right in, probably because he's an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> uh, what does he order? A seven and seven? Seven and seven. Okay. Yeah, That's how you know. He's a real <laughs> alcoholic. Yeah. He's white. He's like wasp alcoholic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he's not, though, because they're Jewish, apparently. <laughs> And he just—he seems like a cool dude. Yeah. Uh, at dinner, dinner. Carol's parents have something to bring up. It's a real switcheroo because it gets dramatic, but it's only because they want to make sure they get married in a traditional Jewish ceremony because uh, their her grandfather is getting on in years and he won't, he's an Orthodox Jew. Um, so nobody has a problem with that, which is it's just surprising because these are the wasp, waspiest looking people ever. I would have loved if they did have a problem with it. <laughs> because that would make more sense right with mcconaughey just like being a total jerk like yeah. no no way we, yeah. we are doing they, christian yeah, they, wedding they even make the joke it was like if he dies before the wedding can we switch back to catholic it's oh, yeah, classic old man. Rolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that old oh rolf yep. uh, so uh then there's a wedding in a, in a park with about 20 people there and marisa and lucy i don't think get invited to it but they watch from a picnic blanket and Maurice now has cornrows, which is troubling. Yeah. <laughs> Twice very offensive. Steve and Carol are about to leave their wedding, but then she sees Rolf, so she gets out of the car to talk to him. She just wants to say thank you. And they talk about, what are your plans? And he says that he's going to go to his parents' cabin for the winter to get some writing done. And then she kisses him right on the lips. Plants he's, one. Yeah. I'm surprised McConaughey Sweet. didn't get out of the car and beat the shit out of him right there. <laughs> he would have been in his... Well, no, not really, because it's not Rolf's fault. <laughs> but <laughs> at least, you know, have a stern talking to to both of them. Like, hey, listen, this is my wife. Mm. Hey, listen, you're my wife. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. <laughs> you can't be the the pe- random ass people on, on the lips. I don't care if it's my twin brother. The time to do this was at the uh, bachelorette party. <laughs> if you want to make out with my brother, do it there. <laughs> Especially don't do this in public. Right. Um, and then time passes and Carol has her kid. She had a boy and he does wind up being a little person. Steve gets really upset and punches the wall. The doctor suggests Steve to seek counseling. And Steven doesn't need counseling. He said he needs new chromosomes. Uh, the hole so, in the wall would suggest otherwise. Yeah. It's, uh, McConaughey versus Adam Driver. Who punched the wall better? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I, th- I would say McConaughey, <laughs> right? Because when, when Driver does it, he gives it like a, uh. You know, just like a, like a hammer fist. A yeah. This, yeah. McConaughey, that's probably probably wasn't supposed to happen. McConaughey <laughs> just punched a wall. Also, uh, did they mean to go to a a, per, a little person doctor? Or was that just kind of thrown in, you think? So, I mean, obviously, because we don't get to see any scene between, like, ever them going to a doctor, you know, as most movies that deal with pregnancies do. You get scenes of like, oh, here's the ultrasound, all that kind of shit. So we sure. never get to see, was it just a coincidence or did they go to a specialist? Like, you know, the uncle set her up with yeah. a specialist doctor because he mentions that, but we never see her ever go to it until she's already had the baby. Again, hashtag release the bright cut. <laughs> so many questions left unanswered. Yeah. Uh, Stephen comes back into the hospital room and tries to make up with Carol the whole time looking like he's ready to toss his own kid out the window. <laughs> it was, I was convinced. <laughs> I got, I was really nervous that that kid was going to meet him yeah. in a timely or, doom. Or just like, he's just going to reach into the crib and just like, kind of like <laughs> suffocate the baby with his bare hands while singing hush little baby <laughs> <laughs> or just like humming it. <laughs> like, Oh Jesus. Just staring directly into the camera. McConaughey would just hum the Texas Longhorns fight song. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's uh, true, and somehow more creepier than Hush Little Baby. <laughs> this is for the Longhorns. <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome, Horns. All right, all right, all right. Oh, that'd, uh, that'd be great. Just him saying all of his catchphrases. <laughs> U A L I V I N. That's what I love about. That's what I love about, love about, about babies. Baby. <laughs> yeah. I get older, and they stay the same age. And they, well, they never get older. <laughs> oh boy. Oh jeez. Uh, I'm I'm sweating so hard from laughing. Oh, oh boy. Yeah, that took a dark turn. <laughs> Even we're for our right podcast. The, we're on the same. <laughs> Swear to God we don't drink on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we're completely sober. Uh, but yeah, that was... I'm glad he didn't do it. <laughs> yes, yeah. That would have been upsetting. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, listen, for our listeners who might have been thinking, ooh, I might have to dump this podcast. <laughs> These guys are getting a little bit too much enjoyment out of uh, Matthew McConaughey theoretically killing his own child <laughs> uh, we do not condone that on they called this a movie no uh no it just goes to show how it's it's just so odd as we've mentioned how never seen a movie where we who we assume is the protagonist becomes so irredeemable by the end but here he is um he just takes the baby from Kate Beckinsale and just shows it so much disdain <laughs> and yeah, uh, he doesn't smile no he just like looks at it like why are you here yeah, it's like my life is over. Yeah. It's all, uh, yeah. Later, it's, it stinks, but yeah. Later, they're home with the baby, and I won't stop crying. Steven says it's cause it hurts. And Carol is upset that he's just angry all the time, and he says it's cause he's a dwarf. The baby is a dwarf. He hurts. I'm a dwarf, he says. And then they calm down, and Steven says it's not working out, so they want he wants to separate because he can't deal with this shit. How do they say how long it's been? From when, no. right, so for all we know, it could have been like a month or so. Yep, could have been like, like day two. Right, like, so weak-willed on Matthew McConaughey's part, man. It's, like, this isn't a puppy where you're just like, you know what, this isn't working out, well, we have to give him back. It's your kid, dude. Yep. <laughs> you just don't have to flesh and blood. it's not for me anymore. <laughs> it's half of you. At least at least give Kate Beckinsale the, the decency of saying you're going to go out for some milk and never return. Right, yeah. Now, who's living in the apartment, too, by the end? Of, is he? Because it seemed like it was hers, and he was just kind of, like, there. And it's also... So, it's so, it, it's so bo- like, uh, like it's so bohemian. Yeah, it it's like, seems more of her style. Yeah, it's like an art studio, and he's just kind of squatting in it. And and there's no way they could afford that, by the way. No, um, not on and, a firefighter and... Exactly. Salary. Right, right. They're in, where are they? L.A.? San Francisco? I think it's L.A. In L.A., yeah, you're not affording that kind of apartment, dude. I'm sorry. Um, at the ca- So at the cabin, Rolf was hanging out with Maurice and Lucy, and Carol shows up with the baby and asks if she can stay with them for a while and then kisses Rolf on the lips again. Oh, then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mark approves. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I, I truly think that we missed out on their, their relationship growing in yeah. this movie, right? Because it goes from zero to 100 real quick. Yeah, there's no there's no indication that it's appropriate for her to show up at the cabin unannounced. Right. Yeah, you, you know? don't even get the phone call. Right. No, I mean in in the in the movie in the in the film she she does she shows up unannounced, but like they share maybe two three scenes at this point. Yeah. And there's besides like kissing on the lips at the wedding, it's just kind of like it's... well you've let me acknowledge that this baby if it even if it becomes a, if it winds up being a little person that it can lead a perfectly normal healthy happy life that's really the the crux of their relationship it's not there's no romance in it until this point on really yeah uh, this feels like it should be the second half of the movie mm-hmm. not the latter third of it right not the last 20 minutes of it yeah um at dinner um Rolf says that his writing is getting syndicated in some papers, so he's starting to succeed. And uh, we learn a little bit more about Maurice and his politics. Um, Maurice says politics that 100 100% fit into today's with it with today's discourse. Personally, I'm on Maurice's side for this whole movie, though he is pretty misogynistic. So maybe not 100% on his side, but um, then Lucy and Maurice spend the whole night fighting because he said some misogynistic things about women's liberation and how they should all just be cooking and cleaning for him. Um, and Lucy leaves in the middle of the night and then Maurice leaves as well. 
Um, at night, the baby starts to cry, and Rolf takes him and coddles him while Carol sleeps. She wakes up, but Rolf tells her to get some rest. He's got it covered. And then one day, Stephen... Oh, what are you going to say, Mark? I was going to say, I guess this is supposed to be the point where you go, oh, this is fell in love with. Right. <laughs> you know? Uh, this is what a husband's supposed to feel like. A husband and father. One day, Stephen shows up to the cabin. And Steve and Carol talk about their future. She says that he needs to be able to show that he loves Vincent and that he doesn't have he doesn't have anything to offer this child as it is. And Carol tells him that he needs to figure himself out before he can come back into her life. She plans to stay with Rolf for the time being because she needs help. And Steve cannot provide that. Um, Steven kind of looks over his kid and doesn't really show any sort of <laughs> affection towards him. That's so funny. It was like, a, OK, bud, I see you. Good for yep. you. See you, in, see you in a couple of years, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see you at your first birthday. So <laughs> Steve leaves, basically leaving his child to be raised by his brother. Le- later, Carol is in bed, shaken up by the conversation with Stephen. So Rolf tells her to come with him, and he lights a fire outside. And then Carol tells Rolf he can kiss her if he wants. So he does. And that's the movie. Ugh. It just ends there. What a terrible ending. Right before so bad. Rolf seals the cuck deal. <laughs> And it's oh wow i was flabbergasted at that ending <laughs> like wait that's it, it it just fades out even even fucking love on a leash had a more complete ending than that movie <laughs> <laughs> that's bad you know it's bad when one of the worst movies ever made has a more coherent ending yeah it's like yeah it's this is a scene that should have happened before Steven shows up at the cabin. Yes. You know, they should be having this moment that you can kiss me if you want to. No, uh, us, the the viewer, knowing full well, is like, well, you're still married, girl. You got to keep it in your pants. But <laughs> yeah, she's I falling agree. in love with Rolf and his ability to act like a human being, which is something <laughs> Steven can't do while he's <laughs> fucking that tall, tall firefighter woman. Yeah, I think it definitely needed to be explored that he's having a pseudo affair with Miss Firefighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Because then it just makes more sense why he's so distant. Yeah. I think you kind of have to remove Maurice and Lucy from this entire movie and mm-hmm. replace them with any sort, any scene that shows affection being grown between Rolf and Carol. 100%. Yep. To be honest, I think it's strange that Patricia Arquette is even on the cover of this movie. Yeah. What a small role for her too. Yeah. It's like pointless. She's she's bigger than she's pretty big at this point. Right. And we didn't go through hers, but she had a legacy at this point. Yeah. Right. It's been a lot like true romance was like 10 years before this. Uh, Where, where was she in her Oh. Little Nikki was a few years before this. Holes. She was in Holes. That was a good movie. That year. Um, yeah, so this. A few years after, she had a, a Stigmata, Bringing Out the Dead, um, Flirting with Disaster was a few years before that. She was in Ed Wood a few years before that. Uh, True Romance. Um, I mean, we're back in the early 90s at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, she's a household name uh, as far as, you know, the Arquettes are a, a legacy family. Um, definitely and I agree I think cutting out Dinklage and Arquette their characters you lose nothing from this movie yeah because they add nothing she was also two years away from Medium which lasted 130 episodes so you know she she wasn't in she wasn't on the down down swing no I don't know yeah it's you know what that final scene needed it needed Kate Beckinsale in a strange hat yeah just to really seal it (laughs) Like she, she has those wearing... camel pants in that in that scene with Steve. Do, do you remember the lead singer from Four Non Blondes? Yes. She should have been wearing the hat that the lead singer from Four Non Blondes wears. The man just hatter like, hat. Yeah, just the top hat. Like, you could kiss me if you want. And <laughs> and Gary Oldman just like going in for the kiss, but constantly looking at the hat. Is it, we're gonna wear this. Oh, okay. I guess we're doing this. Uh, is there anything you would do to make this better? Uh, yeah, I would make it a total comedy. I wouldn't have have anything to do with a kid right we don't want to see our main character hating his child right don't do it uh i would go full rom-com between and it's like a battle between mcconaughey and oldman and they're vying for beck and sales love that's how i would make this better and then you know like she could wear her weird outfits and whatever and 
I don't know. I, I think at, at this point you, you get rid of a lot of the fat pretty much, right? You get rid of David Allen Greer's character. You get rid of, if you're going to keep Dinklage, maybe make him best friends with Gary Oldman. And he's like giving him advice on how to get Kate back in sale. Uh, and that's kind of it. I would just make it not slapstick comedy, but just, a you know, your average run of the mill rom-com. Mm-hmm. But you, Mark. I uh, I agree with everything Dan said. That's that's really good. Um, I, I can't add much to that except to replace Matthew McConaughey with Matthew Broderick. And there we go. <laughs> and just have a lot of inner monologuing. Yeah, have him break the fourth wall a lot. Oh yeah. God. <laughs> worst the worst thing about Glory is his voiceover. Yes. Hundred <laughs> uh, percent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I already said uh, remove Maurice and Lucy and just replace them with scenes of. A, a romance being formed, uh, maybe bring in the firefighter girl as a point of tension between the two that adds to them deciding to separate because it just seems like uh, at this point, Stephen just can't handle being a father in general because uh, babies cry, Stephen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why didn't anyone tell me this? Yeah, so I wasn't prepared. Yeah, that's all. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> um do you guys have anything else to to close out on before we get into anything yeah i was thinking and you could make it quick or however short or long you want it so how i was saying if i were a hot chick my demands for being on a movie is just like something strange what would your demands be to be on a this kind of movie like if some unknown director like we want you uh name your Name your price. I'd want to wear like a T-shirt for one scene that just has something really vulgar on it. <laughs> <laughs> for just one scene. For just one scene. Okay. Yeah. See what if I can get away with it. Uh, hmm. It's actually pretty good. Um. Like something like I, Calvin Dew and Hobbs or something like that. Oh, that'd be good. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like peeing on one of the, like the the logos, like the cowboy logo or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I. I don't know. I guess I would want to um, maybe drive up in something ridiculous. Oh, that's you know, a good one. <laughs> you know, like either some, either go one way with it where it's like a really like impractical, expensive car that my character should not even be in the same ballpark <laughs> as, like a Maserati or something, um, <laughs> or show up in a complete clunker, oh, like it, like at, like at the end of the goods, that car <laughs> that pulls out of a lot. <laughs> that's like hilarious. You just roll up in like a penny farthing. Yeah. <laughs> I roll up in a Model T. <laughs> they wear like those so what, driving goggles. Was, and, yeah. and a, <laughs> what do you Just, do again? And it's never oh, yeah, seen I, again. I write for That's a paper. Still... How could you afford a Maserati? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That'd be awesome. And, it, and in both of them, whether I'm in a Maserati or the Model T, I have the driving glasses that I <laughs> that I take off. And that's the only time both of those things are in the movie. It's just I pull up to a, a house. Just, That'd be really good. That would be really good. Yeah, I don't I don't know what I would do. I would want yeah, I would want it to be something very jarring. You know, like like maybe like a huge mole somewhere on me or like I'm constantly changing my facial hair throughout the movie. Just like I have a full or beard like accent. Just a weird accent. Yes, yeah, something really jarring like you in the have... first scene I'm I'm doing a you know, just a regular accent then in the next scene maybe I'm doing a slight British. It just keeps getting more and more British. Yeah. Essentially, you, actually, essentially you want to be Matt Damon from the wall? I guess. <laughs> it, it, I, I, at the end of the movie, I sound like I'm a street urchin from, like, uh, Mary Poppins. Shine your boots. <laughs> yeah. How about a smile? Two bits. You can kiss me <laughs> anywhere. Right. <laughs> uh, you don't actually have to, even have to be a hot chick to do that. Marlon Brando was doing that at the end of his career. <laughs> well, yeah, it, if if someone were just if I were big enough I guess for sure I'd want to do something and just be completely outlandish something I mean, s- super you'd jarring to, you'd have to get pretty big to get to Marlon Brando at the end of his career yeah I mean I couldn't <laughs> I would never be able to do something like that I'm just saying you know there's not enough milkshakes in the world to get you to that that size <laughs> <laughs> if, um, listen, don't I don't underestimate my love for milkshakes <laughs> um okay you guys want to plug your shit. Make sure. It quick. Uh, at the Aquino 122 on Twitter, follow me there, and also uh, our real play D and D podcast Stranger Damies is on Twitter and Instagram at Stranger Damies for both. Uh, come hang out, say hi, and let us know what you think. Yeah, so uh, Stranger Damies airs every Wednesday. 
Um, that's our D&D podcast, iTunes, Google Play, basically anywhere you can get podcasts. Uh, it's uh, strangerdamies.podbean.com. Um, and then we have uh, Game Vault Pod um, on Mondays, every other Monday. Um, we just had one uh, this week uh, where we talked about our favorite arcades and then picked out our retro roulette game that we do, uh, that we play between the two weeks. Um, so be sure to check that out every other Monday. iTunes, Google Play, at gamevaultpie.bean.com, I believe it is. Um, we were lucky enough, we ended up getting everything to be the same after being kind of having different names for everything. So just Game Vault Pod, and you should find us anywhere. Twitter, Instagram, you know, all that good stuff. And um, our streaming schedule, um, we definitely stream um, Thursdays and Fridays. And the Fridays alternate with a Saturday, depending on when we're recording the podcast. Um, and then, you know, and then Sundays, Mondays, and Wednesdays are sort of, you know, you'll know day of or maybe the day before um, if we come up with something. So just keep an eye on the Twitter um, at Game Vault Pod, and it'll let you know when we're streaming. Um, by the time you listen to this, we will be um, recording the podcast on a Friday, so um, we'll be live on Saturday. Okay, yeah, and that's gonna. We are They Called Us a Movie. You can find us at They Called Us Movie dot Podbean dot com or any podcast streaming app. Just search for They Called Us Movie and we will pop right up. We are the main dot and that is the main website where we post everything up there. And you could find us on all uh, social media at the main Damie. So you just uh, search the main Damy and we'll pop up as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the main Damy. We'll be there. Uh, we are also a proud member geek vibes nation. Uh, you could find them at gvnation.com and on all social and podcasts by just searching geek vibes nation. We got a bunch of great shows besides the ones we do. We've got top 10 with Tia scene and nerd, a bunch of other great shows. Um, check them out. There's something for everybody on that, on, on that network. And we're proud to be members of them. Um, I'm at Ant Delvec, and that's going to wrap this up this week for Tiptoes from 2003. Um, the director of Tiptoes is Matthew Bright. So for Dan Aquino and Mark Myers, this is Anthony Delvecchio telling director Matt Bright to go fuck himself.